Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation, Designing Condensate Drainage from Reboilers. First, a small disclaimer, because I'm only providing tips and concepts today, not any specific advice. If you'd like me to review an application, please contact me after the presentation. Thank you. Let's take a further look at a kettle reboiler with an outlet steam trap. There's the trap set. In addition to sizing the trap and selecting the trap, I'd like you to consider to install a drop down to the trap, a float trap as a preferred trap, and a check valve at the outlet. And you may wonder why, so I'm going to explain those three comments. The first one is most people don't realize, but if a trap is on a long horizontal line, what can happen is condensate is so small by volume, it runs across the bottom of the pipe and vapor runs across the top. And the trap sees vapor, it sees steam, and it locks. It thinks that it's a, it's supposed to stop steam from leaking. The compressed vapor impedes the flow. It's known as a steam lock or a vapor lock. The simple mitigation effect is just to simply install a drop down to the trap and not have a long horizontal run after the drop down. So here we see a video of a float trap in operation. What I'd, I'd like you to notice is that even though the load is changing, you keep a seal over the orifice and you keep steam in the top of the body. It's really critical. It shows how quickly it synchronizes with the condensing of the steam in the reboiler. And that's why I like a float trap. Here you see a little more. There you go. The next concept I want to discuss is flashing condensate. And how does that affect and, and create hammer? with a vertical return. So if you attended the first presentation of this reboiler series, you remember that we had an, uh, an acrylic piping in the R&D lab, and this is around seven or eight PSI, and watch how quickly the pockets dissipate in the horizontal line. So whenever you come from a high pressure out of a steam trap to a low pressure, you're gonna get flash steam. Watch how quickly that can dissipate. So let's take a look at a vertical line, and here is where we're going to the base of the riser. This flash steam is coming in, and it's making a pocket right there at the base of the riser. We've got a lot of vertical head, 30, 40 feet, and we have, you know, back pressure besides that, 25-pound back pressure in the return header, let's say. That creates a lot of pressure on that steam pocket. And when that, that pocket that's pressurized collapses, it can create a tremendous amount of backslam impact during the collapse, and we mitigate the trap against damage by putting a check valve after the trap. It's that simple. So one of our basic considerations is, should we buy a steam trap? I mean, a steam trap is gravity drainage or positive pressure differential. That's the lowest cost option on a capital project, and that's what should be used whenever there's positive pressure differential. But when do we need to install a power trap, like a pump trap system, where we have to evacuate with the secondary pressure? I mean, do you have a process for doing that? Here's one process to consider. So here's an application that's existing, and let's say that the trap couldn't go overhead. So for an existing installation, maybe you have enough pressure to lift it a few feet into a receiver, put just a pump, not a pump trap there, because you already have a trap. And then you just have to deal with the flash steam with something like a vent condenser. So on existing installations, this is one possible alternative that's a relatively easy one to install. But on new installations, if you do a stall chart analysis, you can mitigate and use that stall to your advantage. If you remember in the first session, I, I did this stall chart and all these different points, but the pressure P2 after the control valve and on the outlet side of the reboiler, it was the same pressure, not assuming any pressure drop. Now I'm going to change this number, 115, to 108. So let's take a look at the process loads from 100% of load to 70% of load with 155% of surface area. So 55% over surfacing, our load range from 100 to 70%, and look at the steam pressures. When the tube bundle is clean, our steam pressure at full load is only 19, and at 70% of load, it's in vacuum. But as the equipment gets fouled, our pressure can increase as high up to 108 PSI for 100% of load. So look at that range. That variance is 109 PSI 
And that's how we can advise people whether or not they should consider a pump trap or not. It depends on your load variation and where you're going to get to in point of re, uh, cleaning your tube bundle on your heat exchanger or your reboiler. We pay close attention to the P3 minus P4 value, the TDH value, to select the drainage equipment, make the recommendation. Sometimes it needs a secondary pressure drainer, such as a power trap. Remember from the first presentation, uh, we like to see that bottom of that reservoir or receiver around 60 inches high because that gives us the chance to select the fewest amount of secondary pressure drainers. Let's take a look at some of the key design parameters for the motive in, the exhaust out, and the reservoir vapor space. So here's a kettle reboiler with a pump trap. Let's take a close up look at that. The first thing is look at the blue line, and that is the outlet flange on the channel head of the reboiler. We really want to see that about 80 inches high on new designs, please. It makes it so much easier to install a pump trap system. We can work as low as 40 inches, but that may mean that you have to buy another uh, pump trap for the site for each application. So 80 inches is preferred. And the reason for that, if we're looking at the reservoir, we have to gravity drain into the reservoir. And we want that blue line at the bottom of the reservoir to be 60 inches above that to minimize the amount of pump traps that are installed. Again, we can work as low as 30 inches, but we prefer 60 inches to minimize the amount of pump traps that are used. The other critical thing then is the balance. It's going to have to balance into the channel head in the case of a pump trap. So balance, people may ask the question why. I'm going to talk about breathing of pump traps for the motive design, the exhaust design, and why no condensate pooling is allowed. So here's a pump trap, condensate in and out. There's the motive in and there's the exhaust out. Let's focus on the breathing aspects, just like a snorkeler. A snorkeler has to breathe, breathe in and out, just like that, and the same way with a pump trap. Here, our motive steam is going to come in and supply the pump. Pay attention to the yellow arrow. You see the distance is very short distance between the outlet to the trap. We don't want the condensate to go above that blue bar. If it goes up into the motive supply, into the pump, it can bring debris into the motive valve and it can actually choke the pump and prevent it from having the full capacity. So the selection of that motive trap and the check valve after the trap is really critical. In the case of the trap, we don't want to see a bucket trap used, nor a disc trap, even if it's our own, nor a thermostatic trap, even if it's our own. We prefer to see a float trap or a free float trap. <clears throat> and then you get instantaneous discharge and you keep that condensate from going into the motive supply. You have a nice clean motive supply. The next thing to look at is exhaust. Condensate can build up on the sidewall of the piping, so we really don't want to have a big head on the exhaust because that will prevent the free exchange or exhaling of the gas, the vapor. So we're going to pay attention to exhaust next. Just imagine our snorkeler wants to exhale the air that he's breathed, and the same way you wouldn't want to stuff a potato or a rag in the exhaust of that car, you definitely don't want to have a loop in the exhaust because that would build up with water and then he can't easily breathe out through that. So no loops in the exhaust, please, whether it's a snorkeler or a pump trap. In fact, the exhaust should go straight up as much as possible and always less than 10 feet where it can connect to the reservoir. If it's greater than 10 feet, that's too high, and the condensate can build up too high and create a head, preventing the exhaust from freely venting. So it always should be less than 10 feet, which is almost always easily possible, but if there is a case where you would have to go over 10 feet, then we would just install the piping as shown on the ellipse on the right. So it is possible, but it just involves extra piping. Now the balance point, why is it so critical? We'll talk about level pot balancing first and then channel head tapping on pump traps. Can I tap at the inlet side of a control valve or the outlet side? And again, no loops on the balancing. 
So let's take a look at the level pot with an outlet control valve first to understand that. We want the condensate to be able to flow right through to the control valve. And our balance line plays an important part of that. So if we're connecting to a condensing source of PZ, that brings the PZ pressure into the level pot. So if it's 115, if your condensing source is 115 and your level pot's 115, you get easy gravity flow, no problem. Let's take a look at another scenario where you've got the same condensing source of 115, but we bring in, let's say, 150 pound pressure. Can you see where that would be a problem, trying to get 115 to flow into 150? That's a restriction of gravity flow and causes the condensate to back up. Same problem with a balance restriction in that balancing line. If that line is reduced port, then that can restrict the free balancing that's necessary to have that venting going back and forth so you can fill the level pot with condensate. So if the pressure there is just slightly above 115, as long as you have proper filling head, you can fill a level pot and you can do it with a level pot and a control valve, but not with a pump trap. The best way is to get a proper balance, ideally to a condensing source that makes it easy. You get gravity flow drainage. Let's take that over now to a reservoir and a pump trap, very similar to a level pot, and I'll explain the change or the difference later. So here we're connected to the inlet side of a control valve. There's our pressure P sub X, bearing P sub X down to the reservoir. On the outlet side of the control valve, we have a pressure drop P sub Y, and we have a pressure drop through the rebore P sub Z. Let's put some pressures in there, 150, 120, and 115. Now the 150 pressure is consistent, but the 120 and 115, those are high. When the load diminishes, those pressures will drop. So could you imagine even 115 in the 150? That's a problem. But what if that pressure on the outlet were not 115, but were 20? 20 in the 150, it never is gonna happen. So we have to really be careful about negative pressure differential, especially inlet steam balancing, it's not a good idea. So let's take a look at balancing the outlet side of the control valve. There's your P sub Y. And here we bring P sub Y down to the reservoir level pot, P sub Z here. Take a look at those pressures again. Can 115 flow into 150? If it's a short distance, no. If it's a longer distance and it's a level pot and a control valve, yes, you can get it to flow because of gravity head, fill head. But in the case of a pump trap, you cannot do that. And the reason is that a pump trap needs to exhaust up into a condensing source, and it would be too difficult for it to discharge up into that inlet steam side because it has to overcome the pressure drop of the reboiler. So that's a negative pressure differential situation on the outlet side of the control valve. The best place for a pump trap that you can get proper drainage into the pump trap reservoir is by connecting it to the channel head. And here you see the channel head is 115 to 115. That enables gravity flow, simple drainage into a pump trap. If you've ever used pump traps in the past and you've had a problem, you've probably not connected to the channel head tapping and that's causing your problem. Certainly a major part of it. You need the gravity drainage and there's really no other way to do it than tapping it right there and to be sure. So let's take a look at some of the critical characteristics. We want condensate to flow into the pump trap. That means the upper balance is essential so that we can get the vapor that's in the body to ex exit as we can allow the condensate to come in. That has to be a good vapor space in the reservoir so that the pump trap can vent into the vapor space and then carry on so the vapor space is also important because we'll push air out through there during positive differential and the check valve avoids having air infiltration during uh, vacuum condition. It's important in the balance to have a full port valve, not a reduced port valve, and then the proper location balance on the channel head for tube side steam. Let's talk about the balance line size. So if you notice, if you've got more than one pump, we might see even as much as a two and a half inch pipe required. And you'll probably want to use three inch pipe instead. Now that's critical. Look at that circle at the top left proper location. 
when you order new equipment, if your equipment is such that you need more than 13,000 pounds an hour, then that means you're gonna need two, three, four, five pump units, pump trap units. Your equipment has to have that tapping or you have to have it recertified. So when it's new equipment, why not consider if it's large equipment to order the tapping is three inch, you can always come down easily to one inch, but you can't go from one inch to three inch easily without getting a lot of welding on site and even much more difficult than that recertification. So with a reboiler's proper balance size, proper connection size on the tapping and keep the vapor space in the reservoir, three critical requirements. Now let's take a look at the other side of breathing, which is the motive. We have condensate that filled up the pump and we want to bring a motive in to pu push it out of the pump trap. So we need the proper line size and the header size if we have multiple units to make sure that we don't starve the motive steam. So there you see if you've got multiple units, you might need again a two and a half inch size or a three inch size for five units. Now, believe it or not, we show two inch for three units. And we saw a unit uh, that was another system installed not that long ago, and it had one inch supply to feed three units. It's really not a large enough header. And that's why they were having problems, among other reasons. When they're in steam in the pump trap body, it's pressurizing the body to discharge the condensate. And new condensate coming in where the yellow X is, it can't enter because there's pressure in the body. So it has to accumulate in the reservoir, which is why we need an ample size reservoir that maintains the vapor space. Once we balance into that vapor space and back into the reboiler, now we can flow again and everything works well. So don't restrict the motive line, don't restrict the balance line, don't lose the vapor space. Three critical components for successful pump trap operation. Now there's a difference between shell side steam and tube side steam in terms of pump traps. Shell side steam is relatively dead easy to uh, you know, install. You just, it's really easy. You have to install a proper balance line without loops. It has to go to the vapor space and it has to have the proper tapping. And if you've got that, it's relatively easy for operation. So no piping loops, go to the vapor space and a large tapping on the shell. So again, on new equipment, why not just order it with three inch tapping? You can always go down in size. So if we take a look at tube side steam, this is much more challenging because remember that the exhaust vapor, the, when the motive steam is exhausted, it has to be condensed, otherwise it will build up pressure. The only place to condense it is in the condensing section. So stringent channel head requirements, it has to go off of that reservoir into the channel head, no piping loops below the divider plate, use a large tap on that head, and why not consider three inch, and then you could always neck it down as you need it, but you can't go up easily. So some specialized designs for tight installations that are existing. If you've got equipment close by, you can have a layout design like this. Still, we're gonna make sure that we have all the proper balancing and all that that goes on to make sure that it's necessary. So you see the reservoir, the twin units, and the balance connection. This is an interesting application is a rather large reboiler. And if you see the channel head was really low on the flange, the reboiler was low, less than three feet. So we had to loop down, go up to, into a reservoir and we didn't go near the top of the reservoir. We went in the center of the reservoir. We have to pay attention to that reservoir line. So the reservoir is a little longer than needed normally. And we wanted to make sure that we don't get the water level above the tube set in the reboiler. But it did get a proper tapping, so an application like this can work. But in this case, it would have had an extra SPD over a secondary pressure drainer over what would have normally been used if it were higher. In the first presentation, I did part of this case study, but I thought I would review more of the case study with you. This was that vertical thermosiphon reboiler with 1.8 bar a hot flashing condensate, 3.7 bar on the inlet to the control valve. Originally, because of the large oversurfacing, the internal pressure was only 0.35 bar, which was a negative differential pressure of 1.45 bar, and that's why they couldn't get flow. 
and that's why the condensate was discharged to grade. So in the prior presentation, I showed this one where they changed the transmitter uh, and now they got 2.2 bar in the reboiler, which should have been sufficient pressure differential 2.2 to 1.8 as a 0.4 bar differential pressure. But the high resonance time because this recycle, uh, thermal, recycle, thermal siphon reboiler was so oversized that the temperature dropped to 94 C and then 92 C going into 130 C gave them some sufficient hammer that they had to discharge it. So one way to handle an application like this is go back to the original design in terms of controls and let the steam pressure occupy the reboiler. And what that does is brings the lowest temperature down to that reboiler and you have better control that way. But then the condensate fills into a reservoir. It goes into a pump trap. You're in a negative pressure differential condition from 0.35 bar to 1.8 bar. So you just bring in motive steam into the pump trap and you can push the condensate out with that differential of the motive steam. And then we just push the condensate into the return header. If you were still concerned about flashing on an application like that, it's a rather large header. But what you could do is use this concept that I reviewed in detail in the first presentation. If you didn't have a chance to see it, please go back and see the first one. This is a concept. It's critical that no steam entry could come in here, which means that you can never use this with an outlet control valve because they can bleed steam. You can only ever use it with a pump. Steam would create severe collapse hammer, but you could come off of that large header with a smaller leg and you could potentially connect into the bottom of that and allow the condensate to upfeed into the liquid level rather than spraying like a heat sink over the flash seam by connecting to the top of that line. So a reduced flow rate with a throttling valve, a check valve to prevent backflow, can only use it with a pump, never with an outlet control valve or any other source of steam. It requires no chance of steam in the cold insertion. This would have to be reviewed locally. It's a concept. It would have to be reviewed locally by a, a, a knowledgeable engineer and has opt for safety, but it is a possibility that you could consider. Remember that each pump trap discharges around eight gallons per cycle. So if you had two or three pump traps, you want to consider that they all might fire off at the same time in 16 or 24 gallons. That's where the throttling valves come in to reduce the input. I thought this would be an interesting case study to evaluate the pressure interaction of what happened in this application. So I'm showing reboiler B first because reboiler A was ineffective. And I want to talk about why it was ineffective. First of all, I'm going to show you why reboiler B was effective, bringing in like a medium pressure steam 125 into the reboiler and feeding that into a tank around 14 PSI. Now, reboiler A might have had that at one point, but when we saw it, they were taking steam from that line that was connected to that tank around 14 PSI, feeding it into the reboiler, and trying to lift it into that same tank. So I guess people had thought it was a good idea for steam balance to switch over from medium pressure steam to low pressure steam, which is a great idea, but you have to look at the whole dynamics and you can't get that to work. Okay, so if you look in the far left here, you see there wasn't very much vertical height. It would have been nice to put a pump trap in there, but there just was not enough distance. So that means the whole recommendation was a trap going into a vented pump system with a vented receiver. Now it needs secondary pressure to push it out. So we pull that from the inlet side of the medium pressure steam right there. And now you can discharge it into the tank and you can make that system work and get the effectiveness of reboiler A. Think how expensive it was, what it cost to put that reboiler A in and it wasn't working and how easy it is to bring that back into prominence. So when we do system design with a, our specific equipment procedure is every single piece of process equipment, if you provide us with the full data at no charge, we run that into our stall analysis program software, a stall chart off the extended stall chart, a plots are pointed. We keep the data 
and then the drainage system is selected based on what the client states as their expected range of load. So if it's positive pressure differential, a steam trap is going to be recommended. And if it goes into negative pressure differential, we'll recommend a pump trap. And then the client decides what they want to do. We maintain these records digitally, and they're actually reviewed by four separate people before client receives a recommendation. We provide a detailed drawing like this so people can understand the flow dynamics. And hopefully this type of information will help you with the design of your systems. That concludes this session on designing condensate drainage from reboilers. Uh, I'm open now for questions, and you can always reach me by any of the contact information below. Thank you very much for attending this presentation.